Hey everyone, I wanted to do a quick video on two things. One is uh, the crates that I released um, very recently, uh, the camera related crate, crates, as well as uh, some learnings from that about HTTP 1.1 and 2 and uh, how they support request streaming and how various clients handle that. So first of all, yeah, I have released Car Mirror and uh, the Car Mirror request and the Axum and the Wasm crates. Uh, the descriptions right now aren't too great and we're still on 0. version 0. 0.1. So this is the very first release of them. Uh, I expect that to get better in the future. Um, this is how the crates uh, depend on each other. So basically we have a sense.io implementation of the Carmera protocol, uh, which can essentially compile to anything, which is uh, how we compile it to Wasm because it is sense.io. And then we have uh, the layer above that assumes you're using Carmera over HTTP. And I expect in the future, we'll probably also do a WebSocket based implementation at some point. And then there's the server side in Chimera Axum, which exposes some utilities as well as um, some test, basically, server uh, that you can use for tests uh, to run karma requests against. And I think this can be built into like a small useful binary for quickly setting up a karma server, maybe even next to Kubo or something like that to serve all of your IPFS data as uh, or using karma. And then there's the client side of all of that, uh, those libraries, which is Car Mirror Request, uh, just an integration with request and request middleware, those two libraries to make Car Mirror work with them. And Car Mirror wasn't for wasn't bindings uh, to browser APIs uh, to make Car Mirror requests from browsers via fetch possible. For anyone who's interested in seeing some code, uh, here you can see an example where we set up a small server using the Carmera Axum crate, and we'll set it up with an empty block store, um, and block stores store IPLD data. Uh, so if you want to find out more, if you don't know about that, uh, read up on IPLD.io. Uh, it's essentially content address data, so uh, data is organized in blocks. Every block is just a byte array uh, together with uh, encoded as a certain codec or just raw. And the codec helps uh, to find further links to uh, further blocks. So you can actually encode whole direct acyclic graphs with that or trees or whatever you want. And you can see how we uh, initiate or like create a new block store for our client here. And we put some hello world uh, block into the block store and find out its root CID. And then uh, we do one request to push the data to our karma, or to our Axum server. And uh, you can see the post function is from the request crate. And the run karma push function is actually from the karma request crate. You see, uh, when we're gonna give it uh, the root that we wanna push the store so we can access the data to push. And uh, we actually don't give it a cache. So this cache is basically something to speed up uh, the request uh, because there's some information about how the blocks are linked together that we can cache very efficiently. And that will make requests in general much, much faster and subsequent requests too. Um, and then we just clear out all our data, create a new memory block store. So we're simulating another client essentially and we do a pull request this time and run the Carmera pull protocol and uh, again pass uh, this empty block store and at the end the block store will contain uh, the block that we pushed to the server before. So if you're interested in how Carmera works, uh, essentially um, it works on these uh, DAGs of data, these IPLD uh, DAGs. So um, if you, for example, have a client in a server, they may share some data. So the shared data that they have is indicated in blue here. 
and the client may have some additional data here you can see it in green um, which it shares with the server it may be like a, a new version of a file for example so uh, uh, here the file would contain some data it believes and it would be organized in a, in a kind of a tree way and the server also has a version of the file but it's a it's a previous one and you can see how like you're if you think about it let's say uh, you're prepending some data on the client here and so uh, you only need to add the prepended dependent data essentially um, so um, if we're simulating the protocol here in this case we're doing a push protocol uh, because this is the interesting case uh, for request streaming uh, you can see this is the current state of the DAG for the client and then this is the current state of the DAG for the server and the client will just initiate the push protocol and just start streaming the whole DAG from top to bottom uh, by default in a breadth first way so it will send the root block and then this block this block this block then all of these blocks and so it starts with this and then uh, continues with this block and then continues going to this one uh, but this block is special because the server also has this block so as soon as the server receives this block uh, the server interrupts the client and says wait i already have this block you don't need to uh, to send me this block you're maybe probably going to run into some data that i already have and so it uh, walks its whole uh, so this is the current state of the server here you can see that these two blocks it knows are missing because there's links to these blocks from this block um, but it doesn't have these ones but the rest of uh, the graph here uh, it does have and so it will send both the hashes of these two blocks that it needs as well as all a bloom filter of all of these blocks that are related to this root cid that it already has and we'll encode that in a bloom filter which is a probabilistic data structure that encodes sets um, which makes it somewhat compact and then the client side will know exactly what it still needs to send and it just so happens that it's just these two blocks exactly so it will do another uh, request and send these two blocks and the server will finally answer with i don't need any more uh, cids i i'm not missing any routes and so uh, that indicates that it's done and if you follow this closely you can see that this relies on the fact that we can interrupt a client request that is in the process of streaming a body to the server with a response so that's called half duplex streaming um, which you can see here right you can see that the client is still sending the request uh, or sending like individual packets from from the request and the server in the middle of receiving this one will actually send a response and um, will ignore and will not be able to uh, find out information about uh, the further blocks that it receives here so essentially at some point this is half duplex streaming at some point you interrupt the client and you can start streaming the response uh, right and the client uh, should usually just accept oh yeah okay so he can he, the, the server could answer me uh, without needing to know the rest of the request uh, but there's also the non-streaming uh, version so in the non-streaming version uh, what happens is essentially the client computes or sends the whole request the server waits for the client to be done with sending the request body and then sends the response so what i found was that uh, h like the the streaming version isn't supported everywhere uh, so far what i found out is that if i use axum or which is based on hyper the rust library um, if i use hyper and request which effectively is in both cases just hyper uh, underneath um, this works just fine over http 1.1 so you can do half duplex streaming there and you can actually interrupt uh, the client um, while it is sending a request but if i for example initiate a request using node.js um, HTTP 1.1 over fetch, then Node.js will not be able to 
handle the, the case in HTTP 1.1, it will actually detect that the pipe closed and doesn't realize that there's actually some data that it can read, which would be a just fine um, response. It does not have to send the whole request. But of course, lots of clients aren't set up for this. And in practice, what I found people telling me online is uh, that HTTP 1.1 isn't super reliable out in the wild when it comes to half duplex request streaming. And so we need to use HTTP 2. But how do we use HTTP 2? Essentially, clients um, usually don't assume uh, that a server uh, like supports HTTP 2. So you have some kind of protocol negotiation or upgrade um, involving that. Uh, but it, there's essentially three cases. One case is you do have prior knowledge. So the client just knows the server by name and just knows that the server for sure supports HTTP 2 and it won't even try to make an HTTP 2 1.1 request. Um, an example of that is, for example, if people use gRPC that uses HTTP 2 always, or if you're using curl, you can pass the dash dash HTTP 2 dash prior dash knowledge uh, argument flag. And that will indicate to curl that it can just use HTTP 2 and it will do so, which is contrary to the uh, dash dash HTTP 2 flag, which is just telling it to try to upgrade to uh, HTTP 2. So the other two cases are um, cases where you're first trying or you're basically supporting as a client both HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2. The reason prior knowledge is not something we can rely on is because, for example, browsers don't support this. In browsers, we can't make use of prior knowledge. Um, there's, I think, no way to tell browsers, please use HTTP2 for this request. And so we're stuck with these two other cases. And here it depends on if you're using HTTPS or HTTP only. So if you're using TLS or non-TLS. If you are using TLS, you're in the second case, and there exists a widely supported TLS extension called the ALPN extension, which stands for Application Level Protocol Negotiation. It's essentially, while the TLS session is established, you're sending over an array of strings that indicate which protocol your client supports or which list of protocol your client supports. And uh, the server will respond with the, uh, the protocol that it picks. So, for example, to support both HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2, a client will send a, an ALPN array with HTTP slash 1.1 as well as H2. And the server will usually answer with just H2 as, yeah, I'm going to pick this. And then what happens is uh, the first request that is actually encrypted in the TLS session will just be an HTTP2 request. But if you're if you're not using HTTPS, for example, if you're running on local development, right? You're just setting up your server locally and you want to talk to it from your browser, then there is no ALPN uh, for negotiation, so it works just differently. And the way this works is you're initiating an HTTP 1.1 request and you're adding the header that says upgrade H2C. And uh, this indicates to the server that uh, they can abort this request and answer with yes, please upgrade. And then the client will do another request um, with HTTP 2. In my experience though, the H2C header has not worked with Hyper, unfortunately. And so that has meant that um, our Axum server, the Karma Axum crate, didn't really ever upgrade to uh, H2C. This means it's basically just a little unfortunate for our testing setup. Um, it means that if you're, you're testing locally, in our case, what I had to do is basically do self-signed uh, HTTPS and configure the browser to ignore um, unknown certificate or allow self-signed HTTPS certificates. 
And so that's the way I do local development. Uh, of course, if you're doing this in practice, you're deploying your service most likely under HTTPS because that's like basically the only option with browsers now nowadays. Um, and then you won't have this problem. You'll just have an LPN and you'll be in the second case. So this is mostly a concern for, uh, for local development, but it's just something I learned. Um, there's now this thing where, well, sometimes uh, clients will support streaming and sometimes they won't. Uh, and it seems like we need to use HTTP2 for streaming um, specifically because half duplex streaming is not widely supported in browsers yet. It is supported in all Chromium based browsers, but it requires HTTP2. So my first instinct was, okay, if we want to feature detect streaming on the server side, because, well, on the server side, what we do is, well, if we know we're in the non-streaming case, we'll wait for the client to finish and then answer. And in the half, uh, otherwise we can do the half duplex streaming case. And uh, now like my first instinct was, well, we're gonna detect that by looking at the HTTP version in the request header. But it's actually not that simple since, well, first of all, sometimes you're in the backend and you're actually talking HTTP 1.1 with a reverse proxy that is doing the TLS for you. Uh, let's say Nginx, for example. Uh, while the Nginx uh, proxy will talk different HTTP versions to the clients, either HTTP 1.1 if they don't support HTTP 2 or HTTP 2. And additionally, uh, another problem here is that it just really doesn't depend on the HTTP version because, for example, Firefox will send HTTP2 requests, as far as I know, and um, it does not support half duplex streaming. So you can't use that to feature detect streaming. And so instead, what I found uh, would most likely make sense is there's the content size header which is obviously only or not set if you're using streaming because before you stream all your data, you don't know uh, your content size in advance. But this header is not set in that case. And in the case where you're sending HTTP 1.1 requests or HTTP 2 requests without streaming, this header is set just to the file that you're uploading. And that's how we detect it in Chimera Axum. So yeah, um, this was kind of interesting seeing all of the different ways that HTTP was upgraded and uh, the HTTP version was negotiated and uh, which kinds of requests work for uh, in streaming fashions and which don't, where you can like uh, interrupt the requests and where you can't. Um, yeah, I hope this was informative. Thanks. Check out Carmera libraries. Bye.